Okay, so what did we see this year? What did you call in and speak to us about? Well, there were a whole range of topics. I guess mildew and wheat was one. Um, Netform, Netlotch was another in Bali. All the way down to the end of the season where we saw a, a, quite a lot of false black chaff on wheat. One of the things I'd like to mention is um, wheat leaf rust. So we go out and do crop surveys every year and we noticed towards the end of the year that there was quite a bit of wheat leaf rust in the Geraldton port zone. Also around the Beacon, Muckambudden area and there were even traces around sort of Mount Madden near the lakes. So sorry to rain on the parade of all the variety people but we don't like Brumby. We think it's gonna be a bit of a sucker and um, yeah, so leaf rust is basically one of the diseases where you need a living host to transfer it into the next season or at least to substantially increase the risk and so is powdery mildew. So depending on what happens over the summer and autumn, leaf rust could be around next year. Barley scold, we've been saying for a few years now that it is increasing and we certainly saw a lot this season and um, one of the issues with scold, I guess, is that we don't have a lot of variety resistance in our options that are out there. So if you see it and it's more than just one or two hot spots, you might want to address it, even if nothing else is happening in the crop. And a sort of standard management package of a foliar fungicide will do the trick for you. So taking advantage of the conditions that were sort of happening in a variety trial out at Meriden, uh, Jeff and co went out and they did some ratings. And one of the reasons um, they did this was because even though Spartacus and Maximus in the variety sowing guide, you'll see they're moderately re resistant supposedly to scold. The scold is quite variable and um, there's all sorts of things happening in that population. And you'll notice that there was a reasonable amount on Spartacus and Maximus. So that's something to be aware of if you're growing one of those. I'll go into some of the management um, stuff now. I'm going to go into barley net form, net blotch in a bit of detail, a bit on wheat mildew, and then touch on canola blackleg. So there's been a very aggressive um, strain of planet virulent net form net blotch emerge. And um, the first example I'm gonna talk about to demonstrate this is from the South Stirlings, from one of my colleague Kit's trials. And um, he put uniform in furrow under all his treatments, then applied foliar fungicide, or a range of different fungicides and timings. So what we see in this graph is on the y-axis, you've got the average amount of disease on flag minus one and flag minus two, and it's pretty substantial. Um, these are the treatments down here, starting at around first node, flag leaf emergence, and head emerging, or emerged. So it's quite a worrying thing. This was a real runaway infection. More than 80% of each of those top leaves completely taken out. And even the best treatment, there was still more than 60% affected. So it's, um, you know, it's a really virulent um, pathotype that we've got on the south coast at the moment or moving through the south coast. And... Um, it's, um, you know, just really love the 2022 conditions. The big question, I guess, is variety resistance to this um, uh, pathotype. And the good news is, yes, that there is. This was a um, variety trial up at Cascade. It was actually one of the SEPWA groups, broad acre, broad scale, I should say, variety trials, where um, the farmer puts his variety every third plot so that they're all spaced out. They can do, and they do basic stats on grain yield and that. But when I went, was up there in early October, um, took the advantage to do some more detailed disease assessments on them. And um, I've shown the level of disease here, not quite as bad as um, Keith's site at the South Stirlings. But this blue one is all the net blotch. And you can see that was planet's dominant um, disease. 
there was a bit of spot form at the site and then there was some abiotic spotting. And depending on the variety, this was either made up of physiological leaf spotting and, and or boron. Um, so if we look along the bottom at the varieties that were present, you can see that planet is by far and away the one we have to worry about. So just about anything else that was there was, um, you know, it was substantially less. I didn't put Xena up because Xena was almost identical to planet and that's not surprising since it shares a lot of the same genetic background. So um, if you're thinking of Xena, I would not if you're on the south coast. A second example of um, variety resistance was in a small plot trial that we did at Whitnam Hills, which is the medium rainfall area, or one of them, in north northeast of Esperance. So we had a fairly modest um, amount of disease up here. It was a very dry start for us uh, in that particular location anyway. And um, you can see still the effect of variety. Uh, the trial had Planet, Rosalind, Maximus. Rosalind and Maximus walked through the plots. There was negligible, less than a 1% of disease, of net form in those plots, in those varieties. But you can see that the Planet certainly picked up a fair amount. When we treated it with Amistar Extra at um, Flag Emergence, three weeks after a Prezaro at Z32, we did get some good control. So I'm not convinced that we necessarily did have the really planet virulent type or if there's actually even another type, another pathotype getting around. So I guess the thing we need to sort of take into consideration is that pathotypes are dynamic. They change um, over time and they change in space as well. Basically, they're always trying to evolve to overcome the challenges we throw at them. So whether it's planets, genetic resistance, or if it's fungicide um, application, they're always trying to overcome it. So what we see... Oh, whoops. What we see in the Crop Variety Sowing Guide are three forms of... or the three pathotypes that we normally deal with. But this one is basically rare now. So I wouldn't worry too much about it if you're looking at varieties for, um, you know, if, if you're selecting a new variety. So the beach A virulent type is our dominant one in the central regions and in the northern areas. Um, occasionally we see this other one. And then there's this, you know, there are others including this uh, planet virulent one. So we are doing some uh, screening of the regional uh, pathotypes that we've found in the last year or so. Uh, there is a national JDC project that does this but on a very sort of small basis. So we're trying to do some more um, at a state level as well to add to our information. But we can't cover every location. And so it's just worth bearing in mind that um, the planet response is going to be pretty unpredictable in that Quinana West area if you're growing planet, because, um, you know, we know it's sort of the virulent um, strain is along the south coast, but whether it's necessarily um, sort of moved north, we don't know. We haven't had sort of major reports of um, it getting out of control up there. So strategies for net form this year is basically to change to change variety to nearly anything except um, back to Oxford because we know that there's um, a nasty fungicide resistant net blotch out there. And Rosalind, I think the mildew would probably drive you nuts. Um, Xena should also be up there because that is basically the same as planet. So um, I know a lot of people are looking at it, but there is still likely to be at least some planet out there next year. And so one strategy is to delay sowing. A lot of, um, well, the three trial examples I put up were all sown in that last week of April, first week of May. We could delay that. Delaying um, reduces just about every disease. Um, 
So that's a handy thing to keep in mind if people are willing to actually do it. And um, the other one is to delay the foliar fungicide that you put on normally at about stem extension, if we can delay that by a few weeks. And then we'll shift the fungicide protection period later into grain filling. And um, if you are in a region where you don't have sustiva resistance, so that central, um, I shouldn't say sustiva, SDHI resistance to group sevens um, in the sort of central area and down in South Stirlings, you might consider using sustiva under planet. So those are the, those are the basics. Um, one reason I think we can get away with uh, delaying our first foliar fungicide is because um, the net form in the two um, trials we looked at in South Stirlings and Whitnoom Hills, it didn't accelerate until sort of mid to late August. So um, if we look at these, these two graphs, or these two lines on this graph, show the progress of the disease in the untreated plots. So when we're normally applying fungicide, our first um, foliar fungicide went on 7th of July and Kith's was similar. And, um, you know, the disease was still just ticking along. So really we're sort of, we were wasting that protective effort of the fungicide when the disease was still low. So there is capacity to do that if the levels are low. Um, that would probably be a useful thing to do. Um, so these graphs, bear with me, are pretty complex, but they do um, show a couple of, uh, demonstrate a couple of points I want to make in terms of delaying or fungicides full stop. The first, first is that um, for each variety, these graphs show the NDVI or green biomass accumulation through the season. The black line is the untreated plants and uh, the coloured lines are the um, fungicide treated. So you'll notice that um, there's obviously a big gap between treated and untreated here and there is none in the maximus here because it has that resistance to that um, spot form that's getting, a, or net form, sorry, that's getting around. So you know, you use your variety resistance, it basically replaces the need for a fungicide. It's, it's you know, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, the second point is, uh, as I said, we applied our first fungicide when Planet was at, actually at Z32, and we did dissections to make sure it was there. Maximus, because the maturity was a bit um, quicker, was at Z33, but, um, you know, I think we really could have delayed it a couple of weeks. Three weeks might be pushing it, but at least a couple of weeks. You can see, like, the, the disease didn't get going and start affecting that green leaf area until later into August, later, late August. And I suppose the old, you know, um, monitoring is just critical if you're going to try this approach because um, you want to know where you are at stem elongation. Do we go early or not? where are the disease levels at on those top leaves and keep your water rates high. Um, now we're going to just talk briefly on wet powdery mildew management and it's a pretty boring story. If you could stop growing septa, that would be great. I'd be so happy not to do another mildew trial in my life because you set out to do them and the mildew doesn't appear or it's, you know, it's two farms that way. Oh, God. And... Um, yeah, it's also pretty impossible to eradicate as a disease when you're dealing with such a susceptible variety and, and the other S, S varieties. So the strategy we've had a lot of success with on the south coast has been pretty simple and that's to use for trifold at seeding. I know a lot of guys get their fertiliser pre-treated to avoid ha actually having to, them or their workers having to handle the product themselves and then a follow-up um, foliar fungicide. So in the, and so in the high rainfall regions, there's also, um, we're getting more and more information to say, yes, the, the, the sprays, once the heads are out, can actually be pretty handy in maintaining um, yield and quality. 
so this is this trial is actually from a couple of years ago, and it shows the um, grains per head and the grain weight um, of some untreated septa versus like a typical strategy, and then with or without a, a, a Z59. Um, so you can see that we got a response just from using a normal package with a um, grains per head, and um, there was also an advantage for higher grain weight with the head emergence fungicide. Uh, Wongan Hills isn't normally the location where we'd advocate using a head emergence foliar fungicide unless it's a conducive season like this year. Um, it really is more the, the higher rainfall areas. So I'm not saying to advise your clients in around Wongan to necessarily all do this. Um, pick your season. Um, I can't remember what Amir t called that strategy for making, oh, he had that name for take contingent something, taking all the weather, weather thingies into account. Anyway, I've written it down. Um, I write everything down. Okay, so here's another trial. This was at, um, down on our Esperance Downs research station at Gibson, and we did something a bit better, um, a bit different. We just took advantage of a situation to do a plus minus of um, some Emmy Star Extra, and then we tagged a couple of hundred heads, and um, at harvest we sorted the heads into um, categories of head infection severity. And we got a nice little response between the grain number, the grain weight, and um, a small lift in screenings. So they do, you know, it does appear to be having a, um, an effect on the, the plant. Okay, thanks. Flowering fungicide applications. This is one I did this year at EDRS. This is actually um, azoxystrobin as a single uh, AI applied at different rates, where 100% is the equivalent to the 800 of Amistar Extra azoxy. And you can see we didn't get an increase in grains per head, but we did in grain weight um, for both the, these two. Canola blackleg, there's a lot of stubble out there, two-year-old stubble what will be, you know, this year's stubble and next year's. And all I can say is if you haven't read the resistance guide, please do. It is all in there and now more than ever we need to use it. So mix it up um, every few years when you're updating a variety or um, if you're sowing, you know, more than one variety. So you might have um, this year's group B stubble here and the paddock or whatever next door is due to go into canola. Well, if this is group B, try and find an, an AH or something like that. So you're really um, reducing your risk of um, infection across the, you know, where that prevailing wind shifts all those spores. Um, upper canopy infection, Jean's going to talk about this a little bit more, but the effect of major genes, if you've got effective major genes, you're not going to have any leaf lesions or hardly any, so you don't really, and you don't need to be protecting your crop for UCI. Um, it'll, major gene resistance will do it for you. But once again, mix it up, change resistance groups if you can. So, and that is um, my section done. Thanks, Jean.